Uh, excellent. All right. Well, this talk is called Keeping Secrets, uh, and it's all about encryption. So you've got something that your PowerShell script wants to use that uh, you want to be able to distribute or in some fashion uh, keep out of the hands of people that have no business reading it, but still allow your script to run. Uh, so these could be API keys, this could be credentials, passwords, uh, recipe for brownies, I don't care, whatever it is that you don't want other people reading that, uh, that you need to use. I'm going to pretty much just end with that slide because it's all demo, so. <laughs> there were more slides, but I don't need them. So let's change this back over to duplicate. And, hmm. Okay, so the projector does not get my entire screen. Let me just fiddle a little bit here. Good enough. Alrighty. So, state of encryption, in a, in a way, in PowerShell. Um, there are a lot of different tools that you can choose from today. Uh, it was not the case when uh, PowerShell V4 was, was the current uh, sort of state of the art. Um, and before I dive into this too much, I'm going to point out that there's a, a couple of different use cases that uh, people tend to come up with when they ask questions about how do I save, let's say, a username and a password. So, you know, I want to be able to distribute a script and let my users run it that has some network admin credential, like it needs to go out to my domain controller and do something stupid, whatever, you know, use case that people have come up with. But they don't want the users to know what that credential is. So they start asking questions like, I want to compile my PowerShell script to an EXE, like that accomplishes anything useful. Or, you know, I want to encrypt the password in the script. And yeah, that's great. That means that when I open the script in a text editor, it's encrypted, but the user, by definition, is still needs to be able to decrypt it before they can send that username and password off to the server. For that use case, everything I'm going to talk about in this session is worthless. Because what I'm going to show you is how to encrypt, share, and decrypt values. If the user can't decrypt it, they can't use it. So to cover those scenarios, that's where you want to use something like the GIA module uh, that Jeffrey Snover talks about, where you, <coughs> you set up a PowerShell endpoint where the user authenticates as themselves, and then it runs code from a server on behalf of them in some other context. So you can use the, the tools that I'm going to talk about here to, to encrypt data at rest on the server, but the point is that the data gets decrypted somewhere other than on the user's computer. That's the only way to keep it secret from them. And for the record, compiling anything to an executable does not do shit. It, uh, <laughs> all it does is makes it a little bit more work to read the data, but it's still there in plain text. The only way to keep something really secret is encryption. There's a reason that the FBI is getting their, their panties in a twist over that. Um, so with that, we're gonna talk about different ways to encrypt and decrypt values in PowerShell. What you're gonna find, if you go out and search for um, questions about this, you're gonna get a lot of old results from the PowerShell V2 days, or V3, or, or even V4, where th there wasn't a lot of, uh, of stuff out there. So in PowerShell, there's a few things you can do here. First of all, I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna create a get credential object here. And we're gonna say username and my super secret password. There we go. I did push the button, yes. And so um, I've got just to show you, you know, my, my super secret password. So I want to be able to persist this credential object or this this one string, it doesn't really matter, in such a way that it's protected until I need it. Um, PowerShell has provided a way to do this for quite a while in the form of the uh, two different commandlets that do exactly the same thing. So I can say, um, convert from secure string. This gives me this nice blob of encrypted text. Incredibly user-friendly. I can convert this back to a secure string by just typing to convert to secure string without the as plain text stuff that everybody else uses. That This is what convert to secure string is uh, intended to do without giving you a bunch of errors and warnings. And now decrypted is the same thing. Um, th this is great because it's totally user friendly. You only have to know two commands. Uh, you don't have to mess with 
encryption key management on your own in any way, shape, or form. But what you're going to find is uh, the limitation of this is that it's, it's using the Windows Data Protection API. And the Windows, in the way that it uses it, the encryption keys that it uh, used to encrypt and decrypt this blob are stored in your user profile. So whoever encrypted the data is able to decrypt it on that same computer most of the time. Um, there are sometimes ways to make the same user account in different computers work in AD, but they're usually not turned on. Um, and so that, that's the, people are going to say, oh, crap, this works great, but now I want to decrypt this as my service account or you know something like that. And it can get a little bit cumbersome to make that work. You can make it work, and if it does, then this is all you need. Um, and there's another thing here. Like if I wanted to do the entire PS credential object, um, what I can do is export ply XML and uh, and then um, it does the same thing so the password portion of it is using the exact same convert from convert to secure string type of stuff and then it just gives you the the username in plain text so same thing if I do import ply XML as long as I'm running as the same user account and on the same computer where the export was done, it works great. Um, and I'll get back a live PS credential object. So no problem. And imported is it's PS credential and There we go. So not much that you have to worry about as long as you can live within that limitation. Now, in order to demonstrate some of this stuff, I've got a virtual machine running over here that just is a different computer and a different user. And I've got a uh, remoting session set up so that I can demonstrate this all from the same console window. So anytime you see uh, ICM or invoke command, it's going to be running over on my virtual machine, which will eventually respond. There we go. Um, so if I try to do uh, like this, it's going to say, hmm? <clears throat> using encrypted, oh, I didn't like it, hang on a second. Let's make sure that this is behaving. Yeah, all right. Convert. Oh, convert to secure string, sorry. That's the problem. And it says, key not valid for use in specified state. That incredibly useful error message is what you will see when you try to decrypt it as another user or on another computer. What it really means is you don't have the key, but whatever. <laughs> so, um, so that's where we are. Um, so. You'll, you'll start to see people say, well, if you look at the convert from and convert to secure string commands, they've got these other parameter sets that take keys or secure keys. And you can do that to, to not use the data protection API and just encrypt things with whatever key you want. Yes, you can. Um, this just, it becomes a, a wrapper around AES encryption, which means that the the keys have to be either 16, 24, or 32 bytes because those are the valid key sizes. The problem with this is that you haven't really changed your problem. You've taken one secret, your password or whatever it is, and you've moved the target to another secret, which is now your encryption key. And so you, all you've now you're back in at, at square one where it's like, well, now how do I take this piece of secret data and keep it protected? Well, you encrypt the encryption key with another encryption key, and then you know <laughs> all you're doing is saying that it, it, it takes a few extra steps to steal your stuff. Um, and in fact, that is what encryption is. By definition, it is trading one secret for another, and the hard part is is keeping the beginning of the chain secret. So the only way to truly securely do that is to at some point involve either user input, usually typing in a password, and then you derive an encryption key from that, or having some kind of hardware uh, module, like a trusted platform module, which is supposed to be resistant to tampering, whether or not it lives up to the expectation is, is for a whole other industry to tell you. But, um, you know, it, so what you'll tend to see is actually like that, like chains of encryption. And as a, a good example of that, I like to, to point out how uh, encrypting file system works. 
because it's it's very user friendly in that I can um, I'll just use my my friendly XML file here. You'll notice that there is an encrypt and a decrypt method on uh, on file system info objects in uh, in the .NET framework. And what this does is it, it just encrypts the file using EFS. Um, so again, very user friendly, and uh, you'll find that the, the data protection API is everywhere. Like anything you do in Windows is gonna involve DP API at some point. But um, the way encrypting file system works is each file has its own unique encryption key randomly generated when you encrypt something. And it's a symmetric key, so it's, uh, it's very fast and, uh, and the same key is used for everybody. And then it's going to have copies of that key encrypted by EFS certificates for all the users that are able to do the decryption. So by default, it's just gonna be yours. Um, the private keys to those certificates are encrypted by the user's data protection API keys that, uh, that, that are in their user profile. And then your DP API keys are ultimately protected by your password hash, your login credential. So that's the point where in theory, that's the interactive uh, input, but it's actually not quite as good as that because your password hash can still be stolen by people with Mimi cats and stuff like that. But <laughs> don't let people get admin rights on your machine or everything is stolen. Just is the sort of the, uh, the end result there. So uh, the, the place where you can sort of hop onto that encryption train is, is at the certificate level. Um, it, the nice thing about that is that as IT professionals, we've probably all generated, requested, or installed, or used certificates at some point, whether you're setting up uh, SSL for websites, or you're setting up Exchange, or you're doing WinRM, you know, secure PowerShell remoting endpoints. I would be very surprised if anybody in this room doesn't know how to either generate or request a certificate already. So the cool thing then is we just say, okay, we have a certificate, how do we use that in our PowerShell scripts? To do stuff, and um, you'll if you search for that, uh, you'll find like there's a lot of C sharp um, .NET type of code out there for doing stuff, and you can go that route. But in, it turns out that there's a couple more user friendly ways to do this um, in in more recent times. So um, in PowerShell version five, or if you're running the fully patched uh, versions of PowerShell v4, there are new commands. the CMS message command. So protect CMS message and unprotect CMS message are encrypt and decrypt, essentially. And they work in terms of uh, the level of user friendliness. They're very much like convert to and convert from secure string, except instead of using the DP API with the key that you don't get to pick, they use certificates. And with certificates, it's very easy for us to export them and move them around as we need to. So we can put the public only copies of the cert on machines where we want encryption to happen. And we can have the private key installed only where we need it. Um, and that's how you are able to take a piece of data and say that it's only able to be used by the authorized user. So you can have some blob of, uh, of text, like here I'll just say, uh, you know, I'll take this string and I will say, oops, not convert. I've, I've already got a certificate ready to go for these demonstrations. So, um, and you get this CMS blob. And because I have, uh, here, let me put this on, uh, in a variable. Because I have the private key to that certificate on my laptop, um, I can do unprotect CMS message and I get this back. However, on the remote computer, Remember, if I do invoke command, it's on my, my virtual machine. I'm going to get another not entirely useful error message, but it's going to cannot find object or property. Again, I don't have the private key. You, you need to speak dumb error message to understand exactly what's going on there, but that's what it is. Um, and if, if I try to, you can actually get a slightly different error message if I say certificate or sorry, dash two. Uh, and here it says cannot load the certificate. So it, if you let it try to auto search and find the certificate, you get 
the even less useful error message. If you specifically tell it a certificate that doesn't have the private key, then you get something that's a little bit more useful, but it still should just say, it doesn't have the private key, dude. So, um, and I can show you here. Did you find that on connect? No, not yet. <laughs> Uh, but you can see that the, my, my certificate here is a demo certificate and on the remote computer has private key is false, private key is null. And if I do local cert, I have has private key is true and my private key is a, is a live object. So that's where that is. Um, this works really well with strings. That's what the CMS uh, commandlet gives you, that's really what the CMS standard is for. So if I were to take my, uh, let's, let's try this again. So CMS equals uh, my secure string object, my credential.password. And I still get, begin CMS, that's great. If I do unprotect CMS message, Oops, uh, dash content. There we go. Looks like that should be right, right? Okay, let's... Uh... Oops. <laughs> it, 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 what it encrypted and ultimately decrypted was the text system.security.securestring. <laughs> not quite what I was going for. <laughs> I do not have my actual password. Um, so, so when you pass a non-string object, to protect CMS message, what it will do is it will essentially pipe that object to outstring and whatever representation of it would have been at the console, that's what gets encrypted. Not useful for rich objects that have you know, lots of properties, not useful at all for secure strings because they don't get decrypted. So if you wanna encrypt that sort of thing, you need to convert it to a text representation yourself. Um, for everything that doesn't involve a secure string, you could just use you know convert to JSON or um, convert to CSV or, or, or export, yeah, convert to CSV. Um, and that way it's good. For secure strings, you're going to have to extract that text yourself in some way. Now, one way you could do that would be the convert to and convert from secure string things. And, and there it's okay to use a, a static key that's even well known, doesn't really matter, because the, the value that comes from that is then going to be encrypted again by CMS and, and made secure. So. Um, or if you, th there's other ways, like, like my get secure string text um, function is using .NET Framework stuff. So if I do, you can see that it, it goes out to the Marshall class secure string to some unmanaged string buffer, and then it takes that unmanaged buffer back into a, a managed string and returns that. So, and then there's some, some error handling, but that's one way to do it. Um, if you have a PS credential object like I have here, there's actually a get network credential method which returns um, the, with the decrypted version of the password. So that makes it easier to get that way. Um, so you can do those things. But the point is that you have to do those yourself before you pass uh, your, your rich object to, to the CMS message command. Um, as it turns out, sort of luckily or not. Is while the PowerShell team was working on PowerShell v5 and before they released the version of the preview that had this stuff, I was thinking, man, it would be nice if I had a module with easy to use PowerShell commands <laughs> to work with certificates. So I was writing something very similar at the same time. Um, so I've got, oh, I've got two copies of the module loaded for some reason, but um, there's a module out there called Protected Data that I wrote, which has interfaces almost identical to the CMS message uh, commandlets. The, the parameter names are slightly different, the command names are slightly different, but I can do so instead of dash two, it's dash certificate, but same type of thing here. Um, instead of getting nice standards based CMS output, what you get from my module is a, just a, a PowerShell object. So, you know, it, it's got the same type of stuff, but it hasn't been converted over into a base 64 thing that Linux can read and crap like that. It's really only useful for users of the, uh, the protected data module. But the, the idea is the same. 
main differences between the CMS message uh, module and the protected data, like I said, mine is not standards based in any way, shape or form. Um, so it's, it's good for encrypting and decrypting both from PowerShell, but not for sharing with other services and Linux and whatnot. But the, the good news, the, the positive uh, in compared to the CMS message is that one, uh, this is compatible all the way back to PowerShell version two. So if you don't want to run PowerShell v5 or can't, or for whatever reason that doesn't work for you, um, this is an option. And it will give you back live, it, it handles secure strings uh, and PS credentials without having to, to jump through any hoops. So if I say, <clears throat> this, I get back the actual uh, PS credential and It, it actually has the password. So with strings, the, the, the user friendliness is identical between the two modules and the CMS uh, commands I would tend to favor it, as long as you can run on PowerShell v5 because then you get the interoperability. But for other stuff, um, I like to use protected data. Question? Uh, can you specify encryption algorithms or is it just, just one? Um, <laughs> well, the, the data itself is always encrypted using AES-256. Um, the encryption algorithm is on the certificate. So if you had an RSA certificate, then the copy of the key is going to be RSA encrypted. And if you have a, um, you know, like a, a EC, uh, Diffie-Hellman, ECDH certificate, then it'll use that. That's one other thing that, that I've noticed between the two modules is that I think, I'll have to double check this, but I think the CMS message uh, commands will only work with, um, the legacy crypto APIs. It doesn't do the crypto next generation stuff yet, Correct. but that's coming to .NET soon. So I think that will change um, once the .NET framework built in cryptography stuff supports next generation. Um, the, the CMS commands will probably just inherit that support once it's in .NET. Um, the protected data module does support next generation. So both RSA certificates that are uh, version three templates. So they're, they're still RSA, but they're in the key storage provider that is next gen and also elliptic curve uh, certificates. So, so support for that is in there. Um, and I can demonstrate here that uh, the, the same type of thing happens. If I, tr on my remote computer, it's again going to fail because I do not have the private key. And so here we go, no, no decryption certificate was found. And if I try to explicitly tell it which certificate to use, it's gonna say I cannot find the private key. So I gave friendlier error messages <laughs> that are hopefully uh, gonna, gonna be good there. So um, so those are both the options that, that I would recommend these days. If, if the built-in data protection API stuff, the convert to and convert from secure string and the export and import CLI XML, if those limitations are gonna drive you nuts, use one of these other two things. Just go straight to the certificates and don't try to do your own key management because it really is a nightmare. Um, so Windows already protects private keys about as well as can be done. And in fact, you can even crank it up. So there, there are group policies out there for forcing people to password protect their private keys on their certificates so that every time you use the cert, you have to enter a password. Usability nightmare, security awesome. Um, because then there's not enough information stored on your hard drive to actually get that private key. So even if somebody gets admin rights to the machine, they still can't steal your certificate. Um, hopefully, I, I hesitate to make that kind of statement because you know somebody out there like Carlos is always gonna say, well, Dave, actually, <laughs> I'm still gonna steal your stuff. So yeah, no. talking to security people just makes me wet my pants in fear. I swear, <laughs> the stuff that they can do is scary. So I got through that really, really fast. Um, I have 20 minutes for questions. <laughs> All right, good question. Um, very interesting. Uh, is this on a GitHub or Coplex? Or? Yes, um, the, the protected data module is on GitHub and uh, it's also on the, uh, the PowerShell gallery. So if you're running PowerShell Git, you can do um, find module, install module, that all works. Um, oh, if you're actually on the internet. <laughs> Here, let me, well, I'm not gonna jump on the Wi-Fi right now, but um, yeah, so I can't even show you GitHub unless I, well, what the heck, I'll just jump on the Wi-Fi. So, and easy, whatever. Okay, Mimikops ready? Yeah. <laughs>
do. Well, it's just going to ask for my my name and mobile number, and I'll just give them BS values. So first name from last name. What should I be today? Um, John Smith. I'll be Doctor Who, you know. And let's see. We're going to be from Canada because that's the phone numbers I know. <laughs> and we're going to be one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. There, that's a good phone number. There's probably something in the terms of use that says I'm not going to give you lies, but eh, whatever. <laughs> There we go, now I'm connected. So now I can run find module. Maybe. Ah, beautiful. All right, and uh, out on GitHub, uh, my, my stuff is out under uh, GitHub slash, oh, not logged in, well, whatever, uh, deal Wyatt. So protected data is there, uh, other stuff. But this is the, the one you were curious about, so that's all in there. Um, I guess there's a couple other things I can talk about in terms of how to use these modules. Uh, the the CMS module requires a particular kind of certificate. It, it's called document encryption, and um, in the, the versions of PowerShell that have this module, you can do. There's a new uh, param a new dynamic parameter on get child item dash document encryption cert. So just like dash code signing cert, it helps you find the, uh, the certificates that actually can be used with the CMS commandlets. Generating that certificate, like there's no new parameter on new self-signed certificate out of the box yet. I'm hoping that they add it, but so there's, um, there's a blog post out here by I believe Keith Hill. Um, that shows a uh, cert, yep, here we go. Um, you can generate an INF file to pass to certrec.exe to generate these certificates. And so this is where I go when I forget how to do this because there's uh, this extensions, enhanced key usage equals document encryption and these OIDs. I can't remember that crap. I would love it if it was just new self-signed certificate dash document encryption. Yes? Um, so does it require a It, 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 it just has to have the enhanced key usage uh, extension of document encryption. Okay. Um, and it obviously, it cannot be a signing only uh, certificate. So your key spec is going to be for, for key exchange or okay. whatever. Um, if you don't have that, if you try to use another certificate, then it's going to puke. Um, for the protected data module, it does not require any particular extensions for uh, enhanced key usage, but it does have to have, uh, oh boy, I'm gonna remember. I think it's, oh yeah, here we go, key, key usage. Um, so it needs to be either key encipherment or key exchange, depending on whether you're an R, uh, RSA cert or, um, or an elliptic curve uh, Diffie-Hellman. But when you use the new self-signed certificate commandlet, you get that stuff by default. So if I were to, uh, If I do this, what? Access to, oh, uh, search store location. <coughs> Details, not running as admin, can't do machine certs. Um, now I can do, um, and this will work fine. So now I can say, uh, So I, I tried to make that as friendly as possible to, to work with the, the easy mode certificates that you can get already in PowerShell. Um, you know, it, it's not a huge hassle to generate document encryption certs for, uh, for the CMS message, but it's just something to be aware of. And I believe there are examples of that in the help. So if I do get help, uh, protect CMS and believe in the examples there should be yep here we go so there's one of those INF files um, in fact it looks like they probably stole this from Keith <laughs> it, it looks like exactly the same as his blog post so um, or maybe that's where he got it I don't know anyhow the, the data is there it's just not uh, I would love it if you could just do 
you know, dash something, so, something that would give me a document encryption certificate. Oh, new, actually there's a lot more parameters on here than I'm, uh, I'm used to seeing. So maybe they have improved it quite a bit. I'm, They haven't updated the help, though. <laughs> well, no, I, just, I haven't looked at this in a while. Um, well, it is I'm still not see. Well, the, okay, so there is a dash extension, and it takes some kind of object. So, so maybe you can make it work. It's still. I would still love for it to just be like a dash document encryption, and it would just do it all for me. But that's me. I'm lazy. So, all right. Uh, any more questions? Jeff? We talked about encryption and decryption so far. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen a few customers using uh, encoding and decoding. That. Okay. So well, why shouldn't they? Uh, encoding and decoding, the only difference between that and encryption is math that is bullshit. Um, so encryption algorithms are made by people much, much, much smarter than me and attacked by hackers much, much, much smarter than me. And if the and FBI whines about it. So if all those people can't prove to me that the encryption algorithm is, is crackable, then that means it's good enough for me. Encoding well, let, let's take for an example the uh, Windows script encoder. Remember back in the VB script days where you could encode your script and it gave you this blob? There were no encryption keys involved. That was just some algorithm that Microsoft made up. They didn't publish it, but it took all of like an hour for somebody in France to go, I want to be able to decode these things. So if you Google, you know, decode VB scripts and you find some uh, VB script out there that's got variable names in French and who knows what it means, but it's that easy. Like so. It, it's very, very simple to reverse engineer and reverse encoding and decoding. And without the encryption key, you literally can't break encryption without taking a very, very long time. That's the point. Um, so, and the, the amount of time is gonna be on how big the encryption key is, how secure the algorithm is, how much computing power the, the bad guy has. But, um, you know, if, if you're using say AES-256, uh, which is kind of the, the gold standard today of, of symmetric encryption, it's gonna take like some number of billions of years <laughs> to go through all those keys. I mean, that, that key space is, is massive. So, um, any other question? Could you talk about uh, security and credentials relating to DSC? Uh, yes, uh, D DSC, well, D DSC doesn't, is not sort of a do-it-yourself thing. Um, the DSC, the, the local configuration manager has some support for encrypting and decrypting uh, specifically credentials. So if you have a DSC resource that takes as a parameter a PS credential object, then when DSC compiles the MOF file, it can encrypt that, uh, that value, the password specifically. And when the LCM loads up the MOF file in the target system, before it actually starts running the resources, it will decrypt it. Um, that, like I said, it, it, at the current point in time, that only works for PS credential parameters to the DSC resource. I heard uh, Jeffrey Snover in a session earlier today mention that one of the things they're looking at is encrypting the entire MOF file so that it, you know, whatever's in there, you just treat as sensitive and, and it'll use basically the same mechanism. But um, in order for that to work, you have to use, um, I believe it's a computer authentication certificate. Uh, again, the, the new self-signed certificate certs will do fine if you're using self-signed and the certificates from the computer template in Active Directory will also work fine for DSC and for, uh, for protected data. So um, when you compile a DSC configuration, you need to have in your, uh, um, I'm gonna bring it right here, um, config data. So your, your configuration data, and you're gonna have And some some node. I'm just going to make this up here. So I'm going to say node name equals whatever, and you're going to have a, um, is a file path or certificate file. I think is what it is. So so you've got the public only copy of the certificate available on the machine where you're compiling the MOFs. Um, that could be your authoring computer, but even better would be on a build server if, if this is some automated job that pulls stuff from source control. Um, so the, the MOF file, when it compiles um, the MOF, when you, so you call some configuration like that, 
and when it gets to node whatever, and if there's a, a resource that takes a PS credential, it's gonna say, oh look, I've got a certificate for that. So it will load up that file, encrypt the passwords, and all that stuff will be represented in the MOF file. Um, on the target computer, on your whatever node here, you need to have that certificate, same certificate installed with its private key in the local computer store. So cert, local machine, my, um, the cert has to be there. And that's what the LCM will use to decrypt it. And Ben Gelens, uh, Dutch uh, Paus MVP, has uh, a book about it. The template for the computer certificate has some things in there you definitely want to remove from that. So when you generate that certificate, look at this blog post, he'll tell you what to do. Interesting. I didn't know that. Most uh, publicly validated SSL certificates, like you, like you would buy for a website or something like that, won't work as well. They have the same and keys. Sure. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really common certificates that are. Uh, that are needed for that. Um, okay, any other questions? You get 10, ben 10 minutes of your life back? Because <laughs> I went through that much faster than I wanted to. Um, I can show you a couple of uh, resources since I'm, I'm on the internet here. One of the things that, uh, that worked for me uh, in, in learning to, about encryption to write this module, there's a great website out there called crypto101.io. And it's, it's a work in progress. It's a, uh, a PDF that you can download for free. But what's neat about it is it doesn't just tell you do it this way and not really explain why. It shows encryption, uh, like attacks against bad encryption. So either old algorithms that were found to be insecure or people rolling their own garbage and uh, making it work. So actually, I'll just, uh, I'll just open the PDF here. And there's some really, really neat um, bits of information in here. And some of the stuff that's in here actually prompted me to, to write updates to the protected data module because there were ways that I uh, found that it was originally not as secure as it could have been. Um, so people could tamper with the encrypted data in such a way that they could actually cause things to happen when it got decrypted. And it wouldn't be detected as invalid. I didn't know that <laughs> at the time. Um, if, you, if you're doing a simple AES encryption of something, there's, with, there's no way built into that algorithm to know that it was tampered with. Like there's no automatic checksum or anything that, uh, that goes into the algorithm. So, uh, so it's neat, but there's, uh, there's some graphic representations in here of, uh, of what bad encryption looks like. It's kind of neat. I'll try to find, yeah, here we go. <laughs> broken crypto. <laughs> it's, it's cool to see how that, that works. So, I mean, this is an image. It's not terribly useful, but it shows that you can learn about like sort of the, the macro structure of a message, even if you don't necessarily have the details when you're doing this, this weirdness. So, um, so anyhow, it's, it's a good read if you're looking to implement this kind of thing yourself. <laughs> I don't think I have anything else really to, to ramble on about at this point, so I'm going to push the button.